Hello and welcome to Happy Horror Time Podcast. I am Tim Murdoch. And I'm Matt Emmert. Today's special guest may be best known for writing, producing, and even directing episodes of the hit sci-fi show, The X-Files. But in our horror-loving hearts, he will always be remembered for co-writing the first and third installments of the Final Destination series and both writing and directing the remakes of Willard and Black Christmas. And if you think he's only worked behind the camera, then you didn't see him play Roger in the 1986 heavy metal horror flick <laughs> Trick or Treat. Okay, please okay, welcome. we're ending this right now. This ends right now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh my God, please welcome to the podcast someone who has carved out quite a name for himself in both the sci-fi and horror genres. We're so excited. Glenn Morgan. <laughs> <laughs> As I was saying before we started, that, and I'm not sincerely, you know, it's like, a, I don't do a lot of these. And um, you guys, um, and, and a lot of times it's because people don't do their homework and you're just caught, like, with a weird question or I have to, you know, and it just, like, makes me insane. Yes. I'm a fan of all this stuff. I'm a fan of cinema. And so uh, I really, I really appreciate and respect when someone's done their homework. And unfortunately, you did the homework about Trick or Treat. Oh, we, we, love, did, trick or treat. we oh, we'll oh, get okay. to that. We're taking All it right. in order. No, Glenn, and we are okay. so thankful and grateful to have you here. And the thing is, is that, you know, we always take it back to the very beginning. And so we were wondering, like, as a kid, did you always want to work in film or how and when did that interest develop in you? Yeah, I um, I grew up in central New York until I was 15. And um, they had a show on Saturday, like one o'clock. It was like monster movie matinee. And it was like a local weatherman. And another guy, and they were like this bad track. You only saw the guy's hand. He had these long fingernails. <laughs> and um, it was a monster movie matinee in Syracuse. And they showed all the universal horror movies. And it was like, my dad loved them. And I just loved them. I just, uh, I wouldn't go out on Saturdays and play baseball with friends and stuff until the monster movie matinee. You know, they showed the, the James Whale, Frankenstein, and um, all those universal horror. Those were like, that was my first love. Wow. Was there a certain film that like had an impact on you or like a director or anything? You know, I didn't, I wasn't, I was too dumb to really pay attention to filmmakers then. It was just like the, the, the wolf man, the creature of the black lagoon. And then my dad, he just loved movies. He, he wasn't a cinephile or anything, but he was a great teacher for me. And he would say stuff like, you know, the best monsters are the ones that don't want to be. Oh. And I just like, I don't know where he read that or if he made it up, but he's absolutely right. And so, you know, then you get older. Uh, I started to appreciate Todd Browning and, and James Well, and even like George Wagner, who directed The Wolfman. Yeah. He later directed episodes of Batman TV series, which I'm right now obsessing on. And so, um, yeah, it started there. So you were a big like monster movie person. And did you know at the time that you wanted to make films or were you thinking like, I'd like to be in films or like, how did it get or to both your, or both? Yeah, I, man, I'm old. So it's hard to remember. But, you know, it's like <laughs> you grow up in Syracuse, New York. There's no avenue apparent in 1970. Something. There's no avenue to make movies. And if you ever admitted to my cousins or friends at school, you'd just be made fun of. And so I just kept that to myself. And I was like, well, maybe I'll be a cameraman, you know, something. I don't know. And then my family, my mom, dad, uh, we moved to San Diego. And so now we're closer. It was a yeah, possibility. Yeah. So. so who's laughing now with all your cousins? Because <laughs> you're now the one who's the filmmaker. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. They're, uh, no, they only, they only, um, well, my cousins are younger and back in New York. They only like it. Like when I, when I did the movie with Jet Li or. Uh, the one was written for The Rock so uh, back then. And so it was like, hey, I'm at The Rock. That's the only time they care about me. Got it. Got it. So, um, you know, before we get into all those horror movies that we mentioned in the intro, the and uh, the very first movie that you and your former writing partner, James Wong, wrote was the 1985 crime thriller, The Boys Next Door, correct? Correct. That's correct. So yeah. I feel, I feel <laughs> like I'm on the, the, the January 6th committee. I know. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Correct. Uh, well, so just for listeners, this starred Max Caulfield and Charlie Sheen at these kind of out of control teens committing murders throughout L.A. Now, I do have to mm -hmm. ask you one thing about this, because being kind of an LGBTQ podcast, I've got to ask, like, was all of the rage that was coming from Max character Roy, did that come from being just like majorly repressed about his sexuality? Or did you guys even intend for him to be gay in the script? Did he love Charlie uh, Sheen? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, so. Sandy Howard had written a version of that 
1959, but it's from the cop's point of view. And a film that really meant a lot or still does to me is in cold blood and the, the book, of course, but like, I love that movie. And so Jim and I were, um, we were runners and we're editing trailers and stuff for him. And I just came across a script. And what if this was from the boy's point of view, like in cold blood and they go, great. And so the script is much different. It's like in cold blood. And although I really like Charlie, you know, that was pre- Two and a half the, men. Yeah, all that. <laughs> Free Tiger Blood winning. Charlie I was, I was the security uh, yeah. guard. I know him. <laughs> and I, I like Max. Max was great too. And he was married to. Uh, uh, to I know who Mills, you're talking the about. The nanny? Yes, yes. Fran Drescher. Like, oh no, 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 no. Oh, oh, the nanny. She's, <laughs> I know who she is. There's a little bit of an age. <laughs> nanny and the professor, the... not Fran Drescher. Yes, yes. <laughs> I was like, that's an awesome. I was like, oh my God, I got to meet her. And so, um, but. What happened was what I what Jim and I became aware of at the time was that um, somehow Crispin Glover had got his hands on the script and he read it over the phone to Nicolas Cage, who was doing uh, Birdie in Philadelphia. And I was like, oh, my God. And then Sandy Howard's like, never heard of Nicolas Cage. I don't know who Crispin Glover is. And then we did Willard. Crispin brought it up. And that's what the movie was supposed to be. I don't think that uh, there was, you know, yeah, that's just. Uh. I loved it personally. Wait. I I just found it fascinating that you can make Maxwell Caulfield scary. Like that movie genuinely scared me. And and he's so, a great actor. No, yeah, he is. But great. so so then I'm getting the feeling that the, with the script when you guys wrote your version of it, the like the kind of repressed sexuality things wasn't at all in it. That just kind of came out in some of the performances. Um. Yes. One. You know. Uh. It's. It's. Uh, you know. I'm. I'm fidgeting because it's not. You know. Like I was. We Jim and I were young. I mean, we were like enormous Springsteen fans, and I would have liked that movie to feel like Darkness on the Edge of Town, and that's the. It doesn't. And um, and I like Penelope and all that. And um, but then one time, you know, it's a tough movie. Audiences aren't like we had a test screening and Martin Sheen was there. And Jim and I like Jim Wong, Apocalypse Now changes life. Jim went to Loyola Marymount to be an engineering major. So Apocalypse Now and said, no, I'm a film major now. So it was like Martin Sheen's there. And at the end of the movie, Martin Sheen would have heart attacks. At the end of the movie, he was like out of his seat, smoking his cigarette. And mad as hell that Charlie had made this movie. And we're like, oh, you know. Wow. I think it's and so good. I mean, it fast. My brother rented it when I was like 10 years old. And I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Great movie to show a 10 year old. Yeah. Right. So yeah, I watched it as a 10 year old and I was like, I couldn't quite. But now as an adult watching it with fresh eyes, because we just, I just watched it. It's so yeah. fascinating to see LA in 1985. I just think it's a. I mean, not that it's cool that they're killing people, but it's like... <laughs> really cool. And I promise we're not those people who are like, we're going to find like the gay and everything. I oh, swear. No, no, no. <laughs> it's just... Like, we're not going to be like, it was Christmas. Did I Billy... Really... Oh, no. I recognize the gay bar. So I thought that was fascinating. I just... No, no. Sandy Howard one time said, he goes, guys, I'm thinking about the scene. What do we do the scene? And they're driving in the car and they just killed their first person. And they're like, and Max says, uh, how do you feel? Charlie's like, crazy man i don't know i'm all freaked out and then he's like how do you feel and then max all goes max character goes i i like i think he said like i got an erection and like <laughs> you know your, your your first film and you're sitting there with this your boss this guy that worked with fellini and you're going oh god no and so uh, sandy was going down that path and you know i just didn't want to be disrespectful when it wasn't my you know i just uh Anyway, it was a great opportunity, but I would have I would have preferred it to play like in cold blood. No, no, that totally makes sense. Yeah. That totally makes sense. So, you know, one year later, you're going to get to your favorite one here. You did a script polish on the horror film Trick or Treat, mm -hmm. but you also acted in the film as uh, Mark Price's best friend, Roger. And so we got to know, can you tell us how you went from working on the screenplay to playing a role in the film? Um, you know. I, I had acted in school and I acted, you know, a whole bunch of us kind of Loyola, Jim, of course, we knew each other from high school in San Diego. And then there was some, a, a group at Loyola that we we're friends with. And one was Patricia Witcher, who I, she worked on Titanic and she does Thor and David Witz, who had worked on Dunkirk and, you know, they're all their producers now and stuff. And they were all friends and um, they knew that I acted. And so working at Sandy Howard, uh, Michael Murphy and Joel Soissone, they had trick or treat. 
that Charlie Martin Smith was going to direct. And they had an actor and at the last minute he dropped out. And so they had some auditions and I think Dave Witt said, Glenn should read. And then Mike or Joel said, you should read. And I went in and, and I read and um, Charlie liked me. And, and it was like the best six weeks of my life. I'm like, I, I really have, that you know, it's like a the Hollywood team. dream. Wait, do you remember who the yeah. actor was that, that dropped out of that role? <laughs> um, I, I don't know his name. I believe it was the actor who played the brother in E.T. Oh, okay. Oh, I thought you were. Oh, yeah. See, he would have been better. Cage. You're right now. You're going. He would have been better. It was Nicholas Cage. Once everyone. again, <laughs> he came back, and they were like, "Who are you? You're nobody." Right, Beverly yeah. Hills High School student. Yeah. Um. Um. So, <laughs> did you pursue any other ho- of like movies or horror movies? A- after acting that? roles in them. Yeah. Did you ever try to pursue acting? You know, I um. After that, uh, some agents saw, it and they go, "And I might have had a representative," and so I go for an audition for a sitcom you know, 1985, a network sitcom. And I was like, I felt like, I felt like overplaying Jerry Lewis. They go, it's gotta be bigger. And I'm like, Bleh! and then I go, go, look, guy, I'm gonna turn into a cartoon. Like, no, you gotta do it this way. And I'm like, forget it. I don't, you know, it just, it wasn't for me. And, you know, I wasn't that talented. I mean, that's you play the there dork in a movie that you wrote, you know? We, we beg to differ. I mean, you play, <laughs> no, no, Rod, the funny thing is about that movie is that like, there's only a few characters you remember from the movie. Obviously, um, um, Mark Price's character, the, you know, the um, the metal rocker murder. And Sammy you. Kerr. Yes, Sammy, Sammy Kerr. Kerr, Sammy Kerr and and Roger, you know, you're like the kind of level headed sort of funny best friend. So we we remembered you. Yes. from it. I mean, that's the thing. And well, I mean, Doug oh, Savant you. from the oh, yes, place. Doug, yes. Who, yes. By yes, the so way, say, yeah. that bully was like. Wow, I hope that bullying is not. I haven't been in high school forever, but I mean, if that bullying is today, I mean, that, there's a lot of all, 80s movies are famous for like the most ruthless bullies oh ever. Yeah, yeah. It's, like, it's like a war zone. And and so this movie, Trick or Treat, is pretty one of a kind because not only, like we said, is the killer the dead spirit of a heavy metal rocker, but both Gene Simmons and Ozzy Osbourne were in the film. So what I wanted to ask you was, what were these two rock legends like to work with back then? And most importantly, did they give you backstage passes to any of their shows? <laughs> no, in fact, uh, okay, this is, I, I get on a plane to go to North Carolina from Los Angeles. Most likely the first time I ever flew first class. I'm going to go act there. This is like, with, for Charlie Martin Smith, he, you know, he, he screen tested for Luke Skywalker. He was in uh, American Graffiti. I mean, he was like, uh, you know, I, I looked up to him and he was just a great mentor to me and, and for later I was able to hire him as a director on this TV series Space of Beyond. So I'm on the plane and I'm like, oh man. And who sits next to me for the flight is Gene Simmons. And you know, I don't know him, but for that flight, <laughs> he was the most obnoxious human being I've ever, one of them that I've ever come across. He was like hassling the flight attendants for cookies. And then he had a, a rolling stone and I think Top Gun it was about to come out. And he was gone. He plays Tom Cruise. He's like, look at this guy. Look at this guy, how hard he's trying. And I'm like, you know, you've made your career blowing fire out your nose. What are you complaining about Tom Cruise for? And we didn't really talk that much. And I was like, I just stand clear of this guy. And um, wow. he can't help it if he wants to rock and roll all night and party every day. Right. That's <laughs> I, you know, he's Gene Simmons. I don't, you know, it's. Wow. It, you know, it's how about Ozzy? Any Ozzy, different- well, Ozzy, I thought, you know, I only watched him shoot. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was at a time there was troubles with um I, I think a, a kid had uh, taken his own life and oh. something like that and so that was like really sensitive and like what, what I know you know yeah it's the same thing all of us here as he bites off the bat the rat heads and all that yeah. bat heads and <laughs> he just seemed to be like the perfect British gentleman to me I was really I, I didn't have much besides the guys on the boys next door I didn't have much interaction with actors and celebrities so you're constantly the public persona is very most often different yeah. than what you come across. And I just thought that he was like polite and, uh, and all that. I liked him. That's cool. Okay. One last question about this movie and then we'll move on from it. Um, and it's the most important question about this. Am I answering too long? You're like, no, no. Oh, okay. no, no, no. I just thought, because I know you said, Oh my God, you looked at trick or treat. So I didn't want to like stay uh, too much on it. No, no, no. I like you talk about Doug. We're still friends. Jim puts him, uh, you know, we put him in shows. Uh, Joel and Michael and Joel, I haven't seen for a while, but I go, 
no, you know, sometimes that's... we're going to talk about a bunch of movies or talk about trick or treat or uh, black Christmas and go, Oh yeah, I'm friends with them. I'm friends with them. Or I've done this thing and I don't talk to them anymore. And people are always like, you, I think you believe that you'd make a movie and you're friends for life. But the way this business, that guy goes there and she goes there, but trick or treat, you know, I've, uh, Stayed friends with a lot of those people. That's cool. And it's totally one of a kind. I've never yeah. seen anything yeah, like know. it before. My I, I here's, my, my, here's my thing. I don't know why Sammy Kerr is killing kids. Yeah, I, I we were talking Matt before this and that. I said, it's interesting that the character of Sammy Kerr when he's alive is like this rocker that has problems with authority. But then when he's a dead spirit, he kills all the kids at the prom. And I'm just like, that's yeah. weird. <laughs> I, I, I totally agree. And like, you know, Jim and I did a polish, but Michael and Joel really wrote it. And I was like, why is it that way? And, um, you know, think- like, again, you know, the monster is somebody that doesn't want to be if there's something that happened and turned them that way, or I don't know, but uh, you know, that's maybe he's jealous. Well, speaking <laughs> the script polish, the question was, since you did work on the script, does that mean we get to credit you with writing this memorable line that was said by your character? Why don't you zoom on down to Hunan Gardens, pick up a bag of fortune cookies, and then plan out the rest of your week? And I needed no, to would, know if that, that was, was yours. That would be Joel Swasson. <laughs> oh, I thought I couldn't stop laughing at that line. I was like, that is that is a memorable line. <laughs> well, that was like one of the first like there's a couple lines like I think the character's dead and somebody goes, he's dead. And the line is uh actually I'm not or something like that. And I'm like, hey Charlie, it should be if I'm dead, there goes my grade point average. And <laughs> like I was like, that's what it should be. Let's just do one take like that. I never never do that. And then Charlie's just like Joel likes that line. I'm like, okay. And how many times since I've said, I like that line or so-and-so likes that line. And, you know, I go, okay. That's funny. <laughs> no, that's funny. So, you know, jumping ahead to 2000 and the first Final Destination film. Now, we were lucky enough to also have the series creator, Jeffrey Reddick, on the podcast earlier this year. And he told us kind of the story about how it started as a spec script. And then he wrote the first draft of the screenplay. So we were wondering when and how did the script come to you and Jim Wong? And what were kind of the key changes that you guys made? I didn't know there was a script until after the Writers Guild had determined that that Jeffrey had a, a story by. Um, you know, so Jim and I are like in our office and doing the X-Files. I don't think we're doing the X-Files. What about Millennium? I don't know. But studios were going through and getting X-Files writers as Howard and Alex and stuff. And um, so our agent, uh, Adriana, says, oh, here's the new line. Why don't you guys to do this thing? Look at this outline. It was like, I don't know, 12, 20 pages long. And it was like, I never got by, Jim or I never got by page three. You know, it was death, it was like the seventh seal. He had a sickle, it was a sheriff. It was very much a slasher movie. And I'm like, no, I'm not doing this. And so we go, we're not, we're not doing that. And then Adriano would call and go, oh, you're going to go, they want you to do this. I'm like, no, I'm not, I'm not doing it. And um, I'm not doing the death with a sickle. It's goofy. And so then the agent above her, Marty Edelstein, who um, executive produces Snowpiercer and Hannah now and stuff. He's like, no, you're going to New Line. You're going to meet these guys. And we're just like annoyed. And so in thinking about it, the main problem is you can't beat death. You know, you can maybe someday you could kill Michael Myers or if you wanted to. Jason Voorhees. Yeah. Right. I mean, you don't, (laughs) but you could. You you can, but you can't. (laughs) Exactly. Right, right. And so what are you, how are you going to do that? And so he said to uh, Brian Witten and uh, Richard Brenner were the executives there. And we had this meeting and I guess it was kind of a dick. And I was like, look, the only way we're going to do this is if you don't see death, it's just this force. And I don't know how we do the ending. And they go, Oh, I love that. And we were shocked. And every Halloween, I still go to the Halloween store and go, man, new line blew it. Cause you can't buy a, death costume (laughs) action figure but so they go okay and then jim and i um you know uh we had the plane incident which i'll be honest several years ago you know obviously everybody loves the twilight zone twilight zone had some episodes that they did in video that weren't i believe not in syndication so they weren't as well known. So I get the DVD, the year two Twilight Zone, 
we're watching it and you know i was gonna do my homework for you guys and um i forget the episode it's a video and she's gonna like i don't get on the plane it's gonna blow up and, and all this kind of stuff and my two kids go dad i'm like oh, oh my god so i didn't know about it that was all we had it was a plane crash and um years later i think af- actually after maybe final destination three i was home and um flipping channels or whatever i, I came across the omen too i, I didn't that. realize how how much that had an effect on me oh. because it's all that stuff too the kind of rube goldberg the thing and yeah you know, all that stuff. And so Jim and I just approached it from that. And I believe my memory is that Bob Shea said, who is the founder and owner of New Line, I think he said, you have to have rules like death didn't succeed. You got to go after the people in order of how they should have died. I don't, I, I don't remember Jim and I had that because I would have liked, you don't know who's going to go. Yeah. That's how life is. By Bob's Bob, and it was not a bad note, and so that's where that came from. And uh, yeah, and I and you know it's funny because I think Jeffrey had told us that whatever I think his idea, I think it was like that death was almost forcing people, the people, the survivors to go crazy and like kill themselves and stuff. And then I think he even said he credited you guys with making it like it's this unseen force that came after the people instead of like the darker version of like killing themselves or something. Either way, I thought like it was just such a for us, especially then, it's such a groundbreaking movie because like you said, we were so used to slashers that were just coming after you. But like this you unseen can't see. force and the fact that people are that just survive such a horrible accident still have to contend with now you know still trying to survive death because they had cheated right. it was such a cool idea from all of you guys putting it together that was just really cool you yeah, know and i noticed you skipped part two and then you and james came back for part three was there any reason why you skipped part two i don't remember i don't know if they were going to do two um uh opportunity to I think right the one that was for Dwayne at the time. And uh, I think that's what it was. But, you know, David, he, he did a great job. That's a great, that's a great, really great chapter and all that stuff. I was too. just about yeah. to ask you, what do you think of part two? <laughs> I thought, I thought that was great. I mean, you're still up in Vancouver and like you come across those uh, timber. Yes. And, you know, that's, um, and he was really great, you know, and that's reason I like a guy, but he was like really great to us and really, you know, really, um, he's a really great second unit director. And, uh, and, you know, I have a lot of friends in Vancouver who years later go, well, I was in Final Destination 2 and I got killed. And I'm like, you were? <laughs> You're like, no, wasn't that. I didn't work on that. Yeah. Well, well, so, so, you know, it's like to carry a thing in your head. So one day or night up here, um, at the, at the Hollywood Bowl in the summer. And the parking there is horrible. And you've got uh, a Kawanga or Highland or whatever, boom, and cars are going. And, the other thing. and everybody's having a good time. It's a real big tourist destination. So people don't quite know where they're going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember being on a curb, waiting across the street, small street, a lot of traffic. Everybody's talking. They just saw fireworks, whatever it was, blah, 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 blah. blah. And then the person next to me, takes a step and a bus is coming. The person, you know, behind him or, you know, just grabs him, pulls him back, <clears throat> bus goes by. But everybody around the 50 people, all of us went <gasps> and everybody felt that person get hit by a bus. But, you know, fortunately they didn't. And you just, as a writer, you just keep that in your head. You like, and so try to, you know, we were on X Files. If we were on X Files, we would have done it there. But we weren't on a show, and the other thing, and you're working on a story, and you just go to gym, like uh, Hollywood Bowl and the bus. We got to do that, and blah, blah, blah. And to go and you film it. And the first time we filmed it didn't turn out too good. And then the editors, uh, Jim Colvin and Logan Bright, they made it work. And uh, you go to a theater. And people just leap out of their seats and you're just like, that's what it's all about. You ask, well, why do you make films? Because you go, you think I'm going to show people this horrible thing, this funny thing, this sad thing. And um, that's what it's all about. 
That's so cool. Yeah. It's I mean, such a great scene. And yeah, I, I think Chris Kristen told us that um, yeah, when it was first premiered, she went to the movie theaters and just would, enjoyed seeing people jump at that scene because it was such a surprise when she gets hit by the bus as she's walking across the street. It's so funny because now I've seen it a million times. You have that anticipation. You're just waiting, waiting, waiting. But I do remember the first time I saw oh, it, yeah. it just came out of nowhere. I have a, uh, my friend Gary Rosen. He went to the movie theater on a, on a daytime or something. And he says, I'm sitting in the, I'm in the theater. And then all of a sudden, ushers come in. All the ushers at the movie theater are lining up against the wall. And he's like, what, what is this? It's a bomb? threat what's going on and then the bus hit comes and the audience goes like that and all the ushers laugh and leave oh they, <laughs> they i love when they would come away. in it's like oh yeah. it's that scene again time to go in yeah. and see the uh, i mean I, as yeah. someone that worked in movie theater i used to you know <laughs> so always, yeah. you know, always go, worked in security worked <laughs> Listen, in a movie that's theater. A yeah. job. <laughs> I know, tim, yeah, right. tim is a jack uh, of all trades um yeah. oh so, wait no the last thing because i always forget this but uh in that movie one of the flight attendants uh, he has kind of a page boy haircut. I don't know what he was doing. Is Randy Stone, who I imagine you know, is one of the founders of the Trevor Project. Oh, that name sounds yeah, familiar. yeah. No, I mean, yeah, and he's, we, he won a Academy Award for the short. He produced the short uh, film Trevor, which is where yes. all of that came from. Of course. And horribly, he passed away a few years ago. And, um, you would come across, you know, a gay teens who like, I had no idea he was in Hollywood and how he had helped so many people. And to put Randy in the movie, who had been a child actor, he did music scenes with Elvis and stuff like that. And when I watch Final Destination, I watch Final Destination every now and then because it allows me to see Randy Stone again. And he's, he cast the X-Files. He read the X-Files script. He was a casting director at Fox and he shut it. He's like, David Duchovny is playing this part. And he wouldn't let Dave, Dave's like, ah, I'm doing movies. And Randy would not stop. And um, just, I just, somebody on that movie that I'd really like to point out because he just like really helped a lot of people. Thank you for saying that. We yeah. had no idea. I mean, we're I'm we're definitely familiar with the Trevor Project. Very familiar. Yeah. I've done it gets better videos with the company I work with, and mm -hmm. familiar with the short Trevor. But um, didn't know that Randy Stone was in Final no. Destination. That's amazing. Yeah, he's a. Uh, uh, I, I, I always laugh. Uh, there's turbulence, and they look, and like Randy goes, like, it's "Oh, he's like, <laughs> yes, of course we know that one. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. okay. We're about to explode, but it's okay. It's okay." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, um, so what I was gonna say, moving on, the parts three's opening scene with the roller coaster. So. It's my second favorite opening disaster in the series after the plane crash in the original, because although I love roller coasters, I've always, I think I've always found the fact that you have absolutely no control over what happens to you so frightening. Like if someone doesn't check something or if someone doesn't, if something breaks down, you know, there's nothing you can do. So I was wondering, did you and Jim Wong come up with the roller coaster idea? And if so, what inspired that? Uh, first off, uh, Richard Brenner, an executive new line goes, we're doing the third one. It's a roller coaster. We go, yes, that's how you made deals. <laughs> oh, okay. You're like, okay, we're right in a row. And, uh, I will, I'm going to probably, I don't know if we go back to this or not, but I, oddly, um, I, you know, I, you know, I made Willard for a new line and it made no money. And so I was at the Lord of the Rings two premiere and I'm at the bar with the founder Bob Shea and Bob had been really supportive of Willard and really great he was a good friend of filmmakers and we're having a drink which is not uncommon to do with Bob and um he says well you know sometimes you know it's well acted well shot sometimes people just don't want to go and he goes my marketing guys tell me you know, people want to see a roller coaster and Willard's not a roller coaster. And I go, without knowing about Violation 3 or anything, go, next time we'll do a roller coaster. <laughs> Bob. And he's like, okay. And like, you know, that was it. But that was an odd coincidence that the next movie, you know, had a roller coaster. And so, yes, you're actually far safer on the roller coaster than driving to the amusement park. Ooh, to ride that's the a coaster. scary thought. 
and I, I've heard things like that, but it still doesn't factor in my brain, you know, know. because yeah. you don't have control yeah. of it. And again, it's not like I'm not riding roller coasters, but I just thought like what happened in Final Destination 3 was what always has been my worst nightmare. Stuck what, going on, on, well, and uh, just falling <laughs> off the roller coaster and dying. Yeah. But always yeah. been my worst. So I thought it was such a great way to capture fear. And then I also wanted to ask you, because in both that film and the original, every like the steps that lead to every death are so incredibly intricate and well thought out i'm just wondering would you and jim like plot out every death scene like did you have like a flow chart and every you know action that led to the next action that led to the death or how would you plot that all out well first off i think the the great sequence is the is the last one the bridge oh yeah that's just extraordinary um those are like really hard to uh those movies are tough um, you know, you, you, you bank some stuff, you start to get like people going, oh, I had a final destination moment, which is always kind of oddly <laughs> nice to hear. Um, so Jim and I always wanted to do stuff that you really would come across, uh, our X-Files. We really wanted to do something where the audience in that week would come across it. So your ATM was telling you to kill people. So when you go get 40 bucks, you go, oh, I wonder what's going to, you know, it's like that. So we are really trying to zero in on places and things that were that people were familiar with. Figure the hardware store. So to answer the long one to dance question, the Home Depot and Sunset. I went there for like three days, you know, not eight hours, but like I go there a couple hours a day and just, it was like 2004 after 9-11, no one asked me, hey kid, what are you doing? <laughs> you're, you know, you're making you're like, oh yeah, here's this, here's a rake there's this pointed thing and then you'd find out that like certain chemicals can't be stored next to each other because if they spill you'll blow up the whole place Ooh, yeah. and so i would just go from aisle to aisle trying to figure out how you could go through the whole store and you know you just you can't it's hard to think that stuff up in your head you got to go there um she'll kill me if i don't give her credit but like kristen's like tanning bed clearly I've never been in a tanning bed. I'm like, I don't know. She's like, no, you got to, she's got to go. So I go there down on Fairfax and Beverly to this place. Claustrophobic. Yeah. You know, you're totally naked and then vulnerable. Oh my God. I was like, oh yeah, this is incredible. And so I think I wrote that scene like in a half hour once you got home, you know, and then uh, once you're there, you know, then Jim's like, well, we should do this and we can do this. And then you've got, you know, Mark uh, Freeborn had, had, had been our production designer on a lot of things, and they come up and go, how about this? How about that? And sorry, it becomes fun. Yeah. And everybody says, this happened to me, or this might happen. And so that's how you go about writing this. Wow. So the original ending of uh, part three, that with the test audience wanted a different ending, and you guys had to film a new ending. Or what was the old part three ending? Yeah, what was the original? Uh, okay, going back to the first one, that was that was really our first movie. The other two we talked about earlier were not in, <laughs> uh, Jim and I. And um, it, in working with Brian Witten and Brenner, the idea was you can't defeat death. And what we would do in the X Files a lot of times would be touching. And um, so the idea was that the Allie Larder character was pregnant and life would go on. And so at the test screening, the ending was okay, but you could just feel the air leave the audience just <laughs> after the after all the shock stuff you had. And I'm like, and uh, at the end of the, it wasn't even over. And Bob Shea comes up to our seats and goes, "Okay, guys, really great. I think you got a hit. You need some work to do. We'll talk about it later." And he leaves. And so I'm like, "Yeah, I want an ending." Blah 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 blah. And we go in the next day, and you're sitting across the table. And a lot of times on these tests focus groups like are we going to black christmas like you get like one asshole that i didn't like that and then all the executives go well we got to get rid of that scene i'm like no no it was just because of that one guy and you fight like that way bob shea came in and said i want a bus hit this movie ends on another bus hit i don't give a shit what it is do that I'm like well blah, blah, blah. i go no no bus hit Jim and I left New Line. We went over to this place, uh, the Formosa Cafe on, I think, Santa Monica. And we went out and 
had a couple of drinks and Jim goes, they go to Paris and, and, you know, worked it out there. And so that was that. And um, so uh, you do a test screening and more, you know, it used to be in the old days of index cards. Yeah. I liked it. Hmm. Oh, it's funny. Could be funnier. Now the marketing guys give these people an annoying piece of paper, like a Rite Aid receipt, you know, and um, where'd you go to college with your age? Yeah. 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 What shows you watch all the shit. And on the back, it'll say like, what do you like? What'd you like about the movie? And it was like, some of these Simpson characters, like the writing was like, it was violent, <laughs> you know? It's like chicken and, uh, scratches. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, just like writing like they're like they had a big pencil or something. It was just like the most moronic stuff. The acting was bad. That actor sucked. This was stupid. All this <laughs> stuff. And you're just like, you're really bummed out. Redid that ending. Kerr Smith gets hit by the sign, cut to black. They have another test screening. All those comments go away. You didn't touch a frame of film from the last time you showed it. But with the bus hit, uh, when Kerr got hit by that sign, yeah, that was it. And so uh, sometime later, I said to Bob Shea, like, you're pretty, that was pretty brilliant. <laughs> um, and I, I hate reshooting endings. And that was pretty brilliant. And then he just goes, it doesn't always work. Huh. So I don't know. I don't recall. Sorry. I don't recall what three was. Well, but okay. at the end but, of that screening, but, I went down there and the, the other founder of New Line, the other guy that was the head of New Line, he's just like, you know what? I think people are, are they're expecting what's going to happen. And you know what they wouldn't expect? Kill them all. And like yeah. to hear an executive say, kill your lead. Yeah. It's unheard of. You would have heard that in the 60s or something. And I'm like, really? I like, kill Mary Winstead. She didn't do yeah. anything. They go kill him. Whoa. And so then uh, I think Jim came up with. Uh, the subway derailment. Subway bit and yeah. yeah. It's it's weird because it's almost like you get two for one in terms of big disasters in part three, because that's a pretty big one too, you know, at the end. Big. But I will say it is the one thing about the final destination um films is that you they you usually everybody dies. Yeah. Like there's never like a yeah. happy ending, which you know is good because it makes it different than others and it shows if the main and point is you can't there, cheat death. And there's been five installments. I mean, would you, if they came to you and like, hey, do you want to do the sixth one? Would well, the be- sixth one's already in the work in I mean, the well, works i think yeah one? would would you ever work on another one yeah i mean it comes a point i i stopped jim after three i believe they wanted us to do four and i just said i'm done killing teenagers i just i can't <laughs> do it anymore and uh jim went off into dragon balls and i don't know where i went off to some catastrophe and, and you don't want to go to home depot anymore <laughs> <laughs> no more well, depends i gotta get some stuff <laughs> you look up di- disasters yeah well yeah. we want to uh, since we're trying to touch all of these um big horror films moving on to your directorial debut the remake of the uh ratastic horror film willard which is about for people who have not uh seen it about a social misfit who befriends a ton of rats and then uses them to commit crimes on people who've kind of done him wrong um we're wondering when did you see the original 1971 film and what inspired and 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 what inspired you to remake this film in 2003? Well, that was like I saw it in a theater in 1971. Oh multiple wow, okay. times. <laughs> I th- I think it was like the biggest box office hit of that year. Wow. Willard. And I just thought it was a great movie. And um so uh, what happens is, unfortunately, is that marketing guys and stuff, they want you to do remakes and IP, as they call it now, because it's easier for audiences to want to go see it, cut through the noise. And I just, I don't know, I was in the car one day and, uh, and Kristen was driving and I'm like, Willard. And then um, I checked it out and tried to find who owned it and then... I got the option for it and, um, you know, New Line, uh, we're all good friends and stuff. And I wrote the script. And then agents went out for a bidding war, which is not what I wanted to do. And um, so that was it. Did you notice how I left a lot out right there? Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, that's okay. Sorry. Yeah, okay. Willard, Willard stars Crispin Glover from Friday 13 Part 4, the final chapter. And of course, Back to the Future. We love him. So uh, was he your first choice or like how did, or was there other guys in the running? I, I had kind of, um, I had in mind this actor, Doug Hutchison, who had played a monster on X-Files, and he was just like a great actor. And New Line didn't want that. And they brought up, you know, um, 
Jack Black, Joaquin Phoenix. I had a really long talk one night with um, Talia Shire's son, Jason Schwartzman. Yeah, oh, I really that, thought that Jason. These more comedic type of actors, almost. Well, right? they're all great actors. Yeah, yeah. You know, they're all really good actors, and like, um, definitely an intensity. And, yeah, he he passed, and what happened was like Crispin. I was like, his name comes up, and Jim and I were like, yeah, and another actor, a new line executive, had called another actor's agent trying to get the actor, and that other actor's agent said. Like, who else are they thinking of? And it's said, like Crispin Clover. And that agent said, oh, my God, if that movie starred Crispin Clover, I would see it every month. <laughs> and that convinced the New Line executives. And then we met Crispin and, and we hit it off and he's just ideal. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that's crazy. I'm trying to think of it like the other people in the role or like. Um, I can't. I, I mean, can't. I personally could. Of I course. Like yeah. I feel like I could see Joaquin Phoenix. I feel like I could see him in that role for some reason, just because of the, well, I mean, you see Joker, obviously he definitely can play the intensity. I can't play anything, but yeah. you know, it's just like you surprised at how many people just uh, don't like rats. I'm, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not surprised. Growing, I'm, after I watching know. your movie, I would, they were growing on me. Yeah. <laughs> <Literally, Yeah. laughs> I'm growing. Rats. Well, speaking of the rats, I wanted to ask you about the rats for this film because there's tons and I'm, I can't even imagine as a first time director how difficult it is working just with actors, let alone having to also work with rodents. And I'm just wondering where the, the rodents are way easier. Oh, that's, oh. That's, that's, that's all you took our question, Glenn. I was going to say, oh, which is easier to write. No, but I, I'm wondering how many were the majority of the rats using the film real or were, or I mean, there's obviously some CGI, but were the majority real? And did you have like a rat trainer on set that was working with them to get them to react? Yeah, there was a there's a great animal trainer, Boone Noir, and his guys. And you go to his farm out uh, a Magic Mountain area, and you just like, oh my god, there's a dog from the Pepsi commercial. Oh my god, there's that uh, there's the lizard or whatever. You know, it's like a whole all those celebrity animals are at this place. And um, he told us how it would be that they'd be trained for a specific. This one's going to run. This one's going to go up his arm. And you get like a couple takes to warm up and maybe four or five takes and they get tired and, and they were absolutely right. And, and so we went into that CGI animals, animatronics Jeez. and every one of them said, Oh, we'll, we'll do the whole thing. But you knew that and nowadays you would probably prefer it. Uh, Close-ups of the rats. You could do CGI, but not in 2002. They, would, they, they weren't there yet. And yeah. so we ended up doing the live animals and none of them, nothing ever happened. Uh, one bit on AD who was uh, filling in for Crispin's feet and he backed up and it defended itself. That's not bad. I, I just, yeah. I, I can't imagine again, this was your film directorial debut. Like that's such a, like, I feel like, do you Huge feel like, obstacle. oh my God, like, did I, Get ready for this. Did, did I bite off more than I could chew? Did you like that? You get that? See? Yeah, hey, Glenn, yeah, I've, I've got some, I've got puns in here. No, but yeah. really, were you worried that, oh my God, maybe I have like put too much pressure on myself doing a movie that I have to work with actors, rats, animatronic, all this stuff like that? Or were you like, you know what? I bring it. I on. bring it. Right. Yeah, I didn't, you know, just uh, we've, um, the crew in Vancouver are more than a crew to us. They're family. I mean, you had a great partner in Jim Wong who's going to do a lot of that second unit stuff. And um, you had uh, Crispin and Lee Ermey, who I had worked with before on Space on Beyond. And um, Jackie Burroughs is kind of considered like, uh, I don't know, Helen Mirren of Canada or something like that. And um, so you had a, a terrific cast. It was a small cast and you just went in prepared, you know. No, that makes sense. So the the original film in 1971 ends with the rats basically just killing Willard. It's like a very abrupt ending. But in your version, he lives and ends up in a psychiatric hospital. And I was just wondering, did you do this to kind of just change things up? Or did you want to kind of keep the door open for a sequel? No, I wanted, I think it's in the book, that you do that tilt up to the window and Ben Shadow comes up. Because oh. I do think Willard should have, you know, for me, that movie is all about don't become what you hate. And I thought Willard became what he hated. 
and he should be he should pay the price for that. And so that was and I was going to put Pearl Jam's rats like that was always from day one. That was the end. And then when I put it on there, I wrote I listened to that song 30,000 times. And when I finally put put it to film, I was like, that doesn't work at all. That, wait, that's <laughs> on 10 Pearl Jam's first album, right? Uh, because I used to be, be on. Uh, huge... I think it's after that. Or is it on um, on. Um... Oh God! Versus was their second album. I used to be. A, I've seen him in concert three times. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I, love, yeah. I love Pearl Jam. I yeah. yeah. Know, Sorry, yeah. I know that song. Yeah. So go on, go yeah. on. It was, and I don't. I don't. I think it was that and another case where there's like test screening and you don't want him to die and like do a new ending. And for me, it's a little too Norman Batesy. Crispin like loved it, and Crispin was like, "That guy knows his cinema." Not just Fellini, and, and he's a big Fellini fan, and David Lynch, but he knows pop. He's like, oh, he's got to live on, and I just couldn't. I'm like, well, you know, they die in Butch Cassidy. He goes, no, they live on. They become a legend. Or, well, you know, they kill they kill Nicholson in Cuckoo's Nest. He goes, yeah, but the spirit goes off with the chief. Everything I he could counter me. Oh, Crispin. Oh. So, um, yeah. I, and I take it you're a big fan of his performance in Friday the 13th Part 4. The final chapter. <laughs> I know that you watch that on repeat, right? I have. Um, yeah. You know, I don't know. You got to watch his, his films. I don't know where they're available. And it's a trilogy called What Is It? Hmm. And is it safe or something? That, that's, that's not. Anyway, <laughs> he's a very interesting filmmaker. And um, so if you can ever see his movies, they're like, they're, they're, you won't forget them. I'm, I'm intrigued yeah, now. I'm intrigued. I know, okay, so speaking of remakes, I've been really, really, really excited. Wait, hang on. Here's I brought oh. a show and tell. Oh. So um, you know, Willard was like everything to me. And probably my first favorite actor ever was Bruce Davidson, who was Willard. Yes. The original. And, right. And so at the end of Willard, uh, when we were done in the hotel room up there, I wrote a long handwritten letter. I hope you understand my respect for this movie. I'm sure you have mixed feelings, whatever. I sent it, never heard anything. You know, you don't know if it got to him, you know, whatever. But, you know, we have his, he's Willard's father. Yeah, pictures in the movie. Yeah, you yeah. know, I gave him that portrait, I guess, but I never heard. Um, years later, I did a show in Pittsburgh, with a TV show with Chloe Sevigny, and we needed an actor to play a judge who is actually a pedophile. And like, no one wants to do that. And he came in, <laughs> Bruce came in and I explained what we we're doing. I was so nervous. I didn't know if he had the letter, if he thought it was a jerk or what. And like, I explained to him what I was doing. He's like, you're trying to do a good show because he had been on a lot of stuff. It was just crap. I'm like, I'm trying. And then we really, uh, really got along. Great person, great actor. He had seen the movie and he was like, you know, um, I just can't say enough like so very often a lot of times i don't meet no go on, i don't go out of my way but i don't to meet your idols yeah because they tend to be they it's disappointing and not with him he was like really great so um i live um in los angeles and mark freeborn the production designer one day he texts me and he says hey and i knew that i lived by the house his walking distance from the original the original Willard filmed in a house that's walking distance from me. Oh, wow. It's like they're having an estate sale. I'm like, oh. So I get my oldest daughter, who's in art in the art department now. We walk over there, and the place is gutted. You know, it's like older ladies are selling stuff, and people are looking at estate sales. The place is empty. And I'm like, shit, it's empty. But, oh, my God. Yeah, this is where they filmed Willard. And this scene was here, and there's like a totally geeking out. And I'm trying to find a souvenir. And uh, I go down in the basement and like they have Halloween stuff that you can buy at drugstore. And I'm like, yeah. here's an ashtray. <laughs> no, I'm like, okay, let's go. And as we're leaving, I don't know how I didn't catch it. Uh, corner of my eye on the mantle, I see two of these. Oh, rat. Wait, and, I said, that and I said to the lady, I'm like, um, what are those? And she says, oh, they uh, made a movie here a long time ago, and they use those to fill out the backyard. And I go, okay, how much am I paying you for them? She oh said, $25 my. each. And so my daughter has the other one. 
That's it's my so prized cool. possession. I, I have uh, props from most of my movies. They're down there on the floor, but that's like sacred. That's awesome. That's a great mm-hmm. story. Um, well, you know what I was um saying. Speaking of remakes, I've been really excited to get to the next film that you directed and wrote. A movie that Tim and I love watching Which every year. year, every year during the holidays. The 2006 Black Christmas. Um. So I figured before we get into all the the struggles with the studio over how bloody they forced you to make this film and everything, we'd, we'd love to know how did you first get involved with this project? Because I had read somewhere that you were friends with the director of the original 1974 film, Bob Clark. Um, but how did you first get involved with this remake? Um, Marty Edelstein, who was an agent who said, go to New Line, had become a manager and a producer at that point. And he said... Um, would you ever want to do a remake of Black Christmas? And I'm like, yes. Although I didn't want to do remakes. I just, it's easy to get a job directing what you want to do. But ultimately, I mean, how often is a remake? You know what I mean? Yeah. And Black Christmas is sacred to me. I mean, look, we're horror guys. Yeah. That's a sacred movie. I, uh, I'll be careful because I love Halloween. Wait, uh, <laughs> wait. Halloween, Halloween is intensely influenced by Bob Clark's Black Christmas. Oh, you know, you're talking to, we always joke, but Halloween 1978 is my favorite film of all time, of all time. I, I don't, I like me too. I don't know. No, not some of my favorite all time. But <laughs> it's Friday there. the 13th. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I and, I'm and an exorcist. Which, if we're talking horror, I'm an Oh, exorcist. I love that too. Well, but which is why, which is why I love the original Black Christmas and love all Black Christmases. But I'm sorry, go on. You were saying, yes, it was influenced, definitely. It was the, the nighttime, the wide angle, the handheld, the, the history of the person that lived there, you know, all that stuff. And so, but I didn't know Bob, but I knew that movie and I just saw it in San Diego and the move there. I didn't have a lot of friends. I just like watched a lot of, um, I think it was called channel 100 or something. It was a precursor to HBO in San Diego anyway. <laughs> and um, I just loved that movie. And so when Marty said, do you want to, Will you do this? I'm like, yeah. Um, and then I met Bob and I just uh, loved him. You know, Bob is the type of person. I don't know if you guys like um, no, um, it's a wonderful life. Uh, there's the Thomas Mitchell character, Uncle. I forget. He's got the strings on his finger. That's Bob. And um, like one time they had at the New Art Theater a midnight screening of, of Black Christmas. And I said, hey, Bob, if you have a copy of the original script, I'd love to have that to make reference to it. And he's like, oh, oh, yes. And he's like as Canadian as it gets. Like, oh, yes, Bob Clark. Hey, oh, sure. Hey, OK. Oh, yeah. Okay. And he gets up at the New Art and he's, he's speaking at a midnight screening of Black Christmas and he's got a manila envelope. And he, he does his introduction and blah, blah, blah. And after the movie, he's like, gives me this envelope. I'm like, oh, thanks, Bob. Thanks for the thing. I go home. It's not a copy. It's his script of Black Christmas with pencil notes that he used to direct on set. I'm like, oh, I'm going to lose this. Oh, my God. I was terrified to have it in my possession. That's the kind of person he was. And he was like, um, um, I don't know if he was that interested. Excuse me. And. I could have done anything. I could have made it a musical. He would have been supportive. Really? I'm like, I'm trying to do what you did. And later, I know we're going to probably jump to this, but when I was having my trouble with the Weinsteins, I, I talked to Bob and I like laid out all my Weinstein trouble. And Bob says, um, well, Glenn, I uh, love to help you out. I've just never come across such a thing in my career. And I'm like, oh, okay. I don't, I'm not asking you to call them or anything. I was just looking for an ear or a shoulder to cry on. He's like, okay, I understand. And on the one hand, you should be mad. I had 15 producers on Black Christmas and they all ran for the hills when, when Bob showed up. Yikes. But, no, but, but Bob Clark was like, I want no part of it. Um, and I wasn't going to bring him into it because I respected and loved him so much. We heard from your wife, Kristen Cloak, who we all. She lies interview. about everything. <laughs> <laughs> Total she, lies. She did come across. Who we, <laughs> who we totally, absolutely loved interviewing um, about a year ago about this. But she, um, and she also played probably our favorite character in this film, Lee. Um, and they, we heard that you were both huge fans of Andrea Martin, who um, our listeners 
just in case she played a sorority girl in the original film and then she starred in your remake as the house mother. We were wondering, did you ever consider asking Margot Kidder or Olivia Hussey, who also starred in the original film, to play a role in your in yours? Yeah, not Olivia Hussey. I think Margot Kidder. Yes. I, I, I think she was having, um, I think she was working some things out. Yeah. <laughs> That's my memory. Yeah. And um, to me, it was like, my brother, you know, is an Emmy winning writer. Like we're totally not go out at night on Fridays to see SCTV. It's just like sacred to me. And I, and you know, and she was in that and then I don't know, I'm talking out of school, but I'm like halfway through the movie, Andrew's like, I don't remember much of Black Christmas. <laughs> she was just a kid, you know, she's a comedian, she's working, she got a job, made this movie. And then, so it was like, I just like, I was just so thrilled that she, um, and she's like every, you talk about your heroes, she's everything, wanted to be great to work with. Um, uh, the, our assistant director, Jack Hardy, who went back to Millennium, he did Final Destination, he's passed away. And he had been a photographer when SCTV was up in Edmonton. And if Jack and I were on set and things were getting tough or whatever, and then Andrea would walk by, we'd just go, Edith Prickly. And she would just go right into an improv in character where some characters like, you know, it's not that energy now, boys, you know. And it's, but she was just like, she was just great. And um, I thought what was interesting is like, she came to me and said, um, you know, these girls aren't giving me much. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, I don't think about that. But you immediately got to think about it. I'm like, well, you're an actor, but you really hone what you do on stage mm-hmm. in a comedy club. And it relies on Gene Levy or Bill Murray or, you know, um, whoever it may be. These, these kids are raised on action. Yeah, I'm, you know, an AD is doing off screen lines and cut and then they're off to their trailer. But I would say to Kristen and Mary and stuff like, go ahead. Andrea had carte blanche to do improv and stuff. And um, so, and she said she had called Martin Short going, I'm not getting anything. And then he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just a different era. We come up in a different way. I thought that was interesting. And as a director, I wasn't prepared for. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, we love those types of callbacks and especially anybody who's a fan of the original knows um, who Andrea Martin was. And just for listeners, SCTV is Second City TV, right? Which is a comedy yeah. improv. It's just like in Canadian case, SNL. Yeah. Just in case uh, um, horror yeah. listeners don't know, which is and, and definitely hilarious and start a lot of actors that people now know today as just like comedy geniuses. Catherine but, um, O'Hare and Eugene Levy. All of those amazing people. So yeah. On to, unfortunately, the struggles with the studio and the wine scene. I'm just wondering that other than demanding that you make everything so much gory, or do you remember kind of like the main parts or storyline things or characters that they changed from your original script? Well, the ending, you know, and I thought 2005, it's hard. You know, it was a couple of years before the iPhone. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, oh, this is an interesting thing on you know, voyeurism and being watched and the creepiness of that. And the phone was still a flip phone and it was still coming into our lives. And so, well, great. That's one of the greatest endings of all time. And I don't know why, I don't know why Black Christmas doesn't get the off the credit of the calls coming from the house. Yeah. It started there. And yeah. just, so, just that ending shot of the original Black Christmas as it's mm-hmm. zooming out and you, you hear, hear the phone, phone ring. ring. It's so creepy. And, and Kristen so, told us that the original ending was supposed to have her like with the phone. Her and Kevin. She was Katie yeah. was in the hospital bed. Yeah. Kristen was sitting next to her and we had this big crane shot with snow and the phone is ringing inside the, her cell phone is ringing inside the vanilla envelope. And it's like, you're doing what Bob did but the technology allows you to do it in a different way. Yeah. And, uh, so, you know, I had been, I knew Bob socially, a friend of mine was friends with them. More Bob. Weinstein, not Clark. This is Weinstein. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, yeah. the Weinsteins. And so whatever, they weren't around. And Marty, we, 2929 was the company. And um we went into prep and we started making it. And so right before we were about to go, the Weinsteins bought 11% of this company, 2929. And I was like, oh, shit. I should quit right now. I'm, I, 
But what am I going to do? I mean, it's hard to direct. It's hard to get a show. And so I stuck with it. We did filming it as a joy. All the cast, Lacey, Dean, all those. I know Kristen did a great job talking about all those guys. Robert Mann, I think, um, he, uh, on Kristen's thing, he didn't get mentioned. I use him all the time. It was a joy to film it. And then you cut it like Bob Clark's. And you talk about, to me, that's another great thing that Bob Clark hit is how scary Christmas is. Christmas to me is more scary. The red lights against the black sky. And when you do the research, that's kind of what Christmas was. It's like you were fighting the evil spirits. Uh, Jesus and Mary were running from a massacre of children. It's just like a bloody time. And so I was trying to do that. So I, you know, I have to have a screening, a test screening in Manhattan. And I took myself to the Spark Steakhouse where Paul Castellano was assassinated because I knew I was next. Oh, <laughs> no. I had a nice dinner in some Manhattans and I go to this screening and it's like, and so Bob, I, I, I should go faster. Bob wanted to release this on Christmas Day. I'm like, no. It should be like a week before. So kids come back from college and they reunite with their friends and they go and they go, fuck Christmas, you know? And he's like, no, no, I made a lot of money on Wolf Creek and we released it on Christmas day. I said, that doesn't have anything to do with Christmas. I'm for me, Christmas day at 1130. I'm done with yeah. Christmas. Yeah. And so you're going to release a Christmas movie. Like, you know, that night you're thinking of new year's. It's why they don't release the Halloween movies on Halloween. They do yeah. it two weeks before, so you have time to build up to it. Right. And when when Blumhouse released their Black Christmas, I was like, oh, just the perfect day. It killed me. And then I would talk to 2929, and they come back and they go, um, we, we believe we're leaving $6 million on the table. Why not releasing before Thanksgiving? I'm like, then why are we doing that? Why? What? And they were just, they were terrifying monsters in that era. And nobody fought them. I begged my family to see it on Christmas Day. No one would go with me. Of course not. I don't, I, you know, you've got to watch it before. you got to be part of the atmosphere and all that. Yeah. You walk out of the theater and there's the, the lights and stuff. So uh, after that screening, like I said, all the producers were there. And then Bob, it was crazy because it's like a little, like, a, you know, eight theater thing in Manhattan. And he's like, what'd you think? You know, the numbers weren't great. Cause I, I knew it wouldn't be. It's not what you gotta, you gotta tell the audience it's like this because they're expecting something loud. And I'm like, well, look, Bob, I know that uh, this isn't, you know, you bought into this company and you passed on financing it before. So it's not a movie you want. So I want you to be happy, but I did the movie because I want to make my movie. So let's find a way we both be happy. Like, okay, okay. And then he goes, go, come here, come here, come here, come here. And we, he takes me over right in front of the men's room's door in this theater where kids are going in and they're playing video games and all the stuff. And all the other producers are just like looking across the movie theater. And there I am with this, you know, his, his, his executives used to call him Shrek behind his back. Here I am I with Bob that. Weinstein, the most terrifying person in Hollywood. And he's like, are we okay? I mean, yeah, what did I just fucking tell you? I want you to be happy, but I want to make my movie. I, I know it's not the movie you want to make. He's like, I, if you, we're okay, though? I'm like, yeah. And then uh, by the time we get back to Los Angeles, I get called in at 29 and 29, and they're all the executives sitting there goes, what did you say to Bob once? Like, what? I tell him what I just told you, and he's like, oh, he said that you, you know, told him to fuck off or some kind of thing like that. I'm like, no, no, no. And um, it was just, it was always that. And so then they just, you know, torture porn, hostile. I, I have respect for the Saw franchise. So I didn't think it was that. And he just, he just wanted that. And so they pulled stuff where, you know, I just kept cutting it. I kept cutting it. Stuff that was hurting me. And then the 29, 29 guy comes in one day and he's like, okay, look, uh, I watched the movie last night. And, and you know what? I want to make sure that I'm just like, I hope this is something not like, oh, woe is me. No. For all you filmmakers out there, do what you can, <laughs> you know, because if you don't, you get burned later. And um, they go, well, we watched a movie last night and everything you say is there. And I'm like, oh, oh, thank God. And he goes, but you have to think about it. 
And the last thing we want is our audience thinking about it. We're not here to expand the genre, Glenn. And I'm like, I lost. When I heard that, I go, I'm, I'm done. And then they were going to shoot this stuff I was told for trailers. You know, and they go, oh, you don't have to worry about it. It's just like bulbs on a tree and stuff. I'm like, okay, you know, trying to, you know, be a good sport about it or whatever. And then I have Michelle Trackenberg call me like on a Friday night. And she's like, why am I shooting this scene with a rifle? Like, what? And, and then Dean Friss, he had come down there and he's like, uh, Lynn, I'm, I'm doing this. I'm doing, why am I doing that? And I'm like, what? And then I go back and they had tried to put this in the movie. I'm like, okay, wait a minute. If you see that trailer with Michelle Trackenberg of the rifle and it's not in the movie, you're upset. And, yeah. and if you want to see a movie like we're making and you see Michelle Trackenberg with the rifle, you don't want to go see it. Yeah, and yeah, so absolutely. that's all. I the do stuff remember we... the trailer being like, I was like, there was a scenes? lot of scenes that weren't. Yeah. In. I I just what I don't get, and again, I haven't worked in this industry like you, but what I don't get is that the what made the original so great is that it's suspenseful and slow and creepy. And I know you kind of wanted to capture more of that atmospheric type of, um, um, you know, feeling for Black Christmas. And I just wonder why, I guess because the movies at that time, like Hostel and stuff were doing well, they just wanted to just add torture and, and more gore and why they thought that would be more effective. You think it was just because of the time period and what was doing well then? Yeah, yeah you know, it's gone away. I think, um, excuse me, I think a couple things one, definitely the time period, torture and enhanced interrogation techniques were in the news. Yeah. And um, they've fallen out of the news. I'm sure they still happen. But and and in two, like what we talk about is you start with uh, it happens in comedy, too. You start with Black Christmas is this. And maybe the exorcist, I don't know which came first, but and then the exorcist is a little louder. But then you come with Halloween. It's a little bigger than Black Christmas. We go well that then we do this and then you start to get into um pyramid you know, friday sorry the friday the 13th it's and, okay, yeah, it's yeah. Okay. and then you got jason's got fire and then it just keeps escalating i get it because you yeah. can't like and you go back to black christmas you can have a lot of fans going so slow i i but see that's what it that was. but yeah it just and it's also so it sounds like also, the Weinsteins are probably responsible for killing off Kristen in the movie, because if you were going to have her uh, alive and we told her this, yeah. we were literally the most upsetting part of that movie for us. And I swear we're not just saying this because it's you and Kristen was her dying because it's like she and, and Katie Cassidy, they, had a make, bond. They, they bonded, they make it till the end. And then she just gets her neck snapped. And I'm like, what a just like, yeah, yeah. not cool. That was just they don't care. You know, I really believe, you know, whether it's a, a horror or a regular, you got to. You got to earn that. You have to have been responsible for somebody else dying and not care. Or you, you know, you know, Macbeth killed the king and he's got to get his head cut off. You know, you got to pay a price. You know, Roger Corman said the person that should get killed is the last, the last person to have had sex. So they were morally punished, you know. And so I just felt like, what was the point of that other than to have a murder? And I just, you know, murder makes me kind of like, you know, obviously. And you had already had like nine murders. So, I mean, yeah, it was weird that poor, poor Lee didn't survive. But we love it, Agnes. <laughs> uh, yes, yes. And Derek, <laughs> yeah. We heard great things about Agnes is terrifying. Yeah, we love it. And yeah. we already asked Kristen about this. And she told us the story of like how I mean, he was casting out. Because when you first th see that the female role of Agnes is played by a male, it's almost like, well, why did you choose that? But I know, you know, he had a certain face that you thought worked really well. And it was like the features kind of worked well, I guess. But it, it's such a terrifying character and done really well the tiptoeing so. around the tree oh, he's <laughs> the sweetest most lovely guy we're still really good friends we'll talk every couple months or whatever and you know he's uh right now he's doing uh what you call a b cam it's a secondary cam on um well it was on bat woman but i i don't know if that shows around anymore oh. so he's up in vancouver doing that so I do have to ask, does he ever crank call you and say, you're my family now? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, Dean, when I first met him, like uh, he had been wearing an Oakland Raiders jersey and I'm a Charger fan. And that's just disgusting to me. I'm like, look, pal, I don't know. You're going to have to leave my set unless you put on a Charger thing and it became a thing. And so we become friends and I bought him a San Diego Chargers jersey 
and Black Christmas came, he came down for the premiere and Dean's just like, you know, a Central Plains hockey kid, Canadian farm boy. And he comes down and my daughter, we were like, it's a small world. And I said to Kristen, I'm like, it was like a dream. I'm like, okay, I'm in a small world with Dean Friss and he's wearing a Charger jersey. It was really, it was really strange. Okay, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. I hope here's, I'm told, you know, uh, as a guy writing a book, I was about the Black Christmases or whatever. Um, he's a gay author. And he's like, you have such a big following. I've talked to uh, Crystal Lowe and said, Black Christmas has such a big gay following. Yeah. And I don't know why. I, I think well, it's because it's the whole sorority girl aspect of it. They're kind of bitchy to each other. You know, you know I, what I mean? Like here, here's the thing: you want to br- see them get killed. I totally agree. <laughs> you you bring an interesting point. Well, first off, there the horror lovers. There's a yeah. there's a weird like subculture of gay horror lovers. I don't know why. Maybe it's the the thrill because I I don't even want to go into psychology, but maybe because for me personally, I think it was just because these horror films were rated R. It was forbidden, so you think like you're getting away with something. Thing. Yeah, and I also right, think right. that a lot of gay men really love seeing empowered females and yeah. love seeing mm-hmm. females in roles like this. They love the sorority, like kind of bitchy aspect like that. And so, Kristen is like really good at yeah. it. Yeah. Well, and <laughs> yeah. so we, and so I think Black Christmas, it has horror, it has all these like tough girls, and you know, it has the kind of cattiness and, and sororityness. And so it has everything a gay man loves. Yeah. And it's atmospheric. <laughs> it's like, right. it's, it's shot okay. so beautifully. Yeah, it is true. I do have one last question on, on Black Christmas. This is such a random thing, but I had to ask to see if you knew because we read a rumor online, I think it's on IMDb trivia, that after this film came out, Bob Clark was either thinking about or wanting to work on a direct sequel to his Black Christmas that would have brought back Olivia Hussey and John Saxon's characters back. But unfortunately, he unfortunately passed away like a year later. Did he ever mention this or that he was thinking of returning and making a sequel to his or? Okay, this is going to get me in trouble and you're going to get mad. I'm just um, telling you what Bob said. Bob said, this is Bob, I'm relaying what Bob Clark said to me. He said, John Carpenter said, would you ever do a sequel to Black Christmas? He goes, yes, I call it Halloween. The guy goes back to the house. So now, like I said, I love Bob, but like one day I call Bob and go, call him up and go, he'd answer the phone. Hello? I'm like, um, Bob Clark? He goes, oh, um, who's calling? He goes, Glenn Morgan. He goes, oh, hey, Glenn. (laughs) <laughs> I'm like, you, know, you know some people okay how are you doing he, he was he was a little mad uh mad absent-minded professor yeah but a great i mean you know murder by decree and all that so i mean he just like went from genre to genre i really respect guys like on the story Wilder. yeah <laughs> christmas story yeah. which and he said like bob said at the time 2005 he was in the process he was about to sue warner brothers because they made Christmas Story in 1979, I think, for $4 billion, 400000 was his money so they could shoot in Cleveland during the snow. In 2005, Warner Brothers said, we haven't, we've just lost money. And he was suing them. And then my, my agent's like, they don't respect you unless you sue to audit. And it's like, I'm like, Bob, I have three DVD versions of Christmas Story. What are you talking about? It's on, it plays 24 hours a day on TBS. You know, they've made sequels. And so he was that kind of guy that he was, didn't want to trouble Warner Brothers for ripping him off. Wow. Trouble Warner Brothers. So so it sounds like there was no real sequel plan. I I doubt that. I I think he could have done it. Yeah. Halloween was kind of a (laughs) yeah Halloween I definitely see that um I mean very and everything has elements of everything else so it's like totally get that but I thought that was interesting I was like what what's that really happening but it sounds like if like that he was already working on something but that would have been made yeah if Bob had wanted to do that movie that would have been made exactly well just a couple wrap-up questions um for you Glenn like we know um 
obviously a, a couple of years ago, you served as an executive producer and wrote a number of episodes of the latest revival, The Twilight Zone, um, which is awesome. And obviously you've worked on The X-Files and um, TV. And I'm wondering, would you ever consider making another horror movie or do you prefer working on TV now? No, I've just, I've been in film jail since... Uh... <laughs> But, you know, actually, the the uh, what's his name's actually in jail. Yeah, <laughs> Harvey Weinstein is actually Bob's, in jail. Bob's not. Yeah. Oh, oh that's is. But, re- like, Bob's do they, not. That is really true. like when you say that, is that re- like you wouldn't be able to make another movie because of those things? Because that's so I just, disappointing. I don't know. I don't know now. I, I don't know. But, it you know, it's um I don't know. Um But, you know, it's like after that, then Jim and I went our separate ways. Very friendly. Like we're still you know we're lifelong brothers and um but yeah when you break up like that you got to start over mm-hmm. and so it was like then i went into other okay so that okay no i'm i would tell you my favorite horror related story if that's all right of Please. course i'm on <laughs> i'm on bionic woman which was which the office the tv show the offices are on um the universal backlog and so our office was by warner brothers which is uh barham the executives are way over on the other side on Lancashire. There's a whole back lot where you take the tour and the whole deal. So in order to like, if you had to go have a meeting, they furnish you with a little golf cart. Whenever I was bummed out or like stressed out, which is often on that show, my brother, who was a writer too, like we'd get in a golf cart and we'd just go drive around the back lot. My brother would know all the, you know, it's like, that's the Black Pussy Cafe from the bank dick with WC Fields. And I'm like, this is where... Uh, you know, Lon Chaney Jr. bought the silver tipped cane and the Wolfman and stuff. So it was like the back lot, you know. So I'm on that show. It's a catastrophe. And um, I go to the executive. I'm like, look, you got five problems. You have to tell, also, I'll do it for you. But you have to tell me how you want them fixed. And they're this, 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 and that. Uh, the executive says, thank you, boy. Yeah. Thanks for telling me. I really appreciate it. That's really great. I go home. I'm like, hey. Next day, 9.30, first thing I get a call from the executive. It's like, um, well, this this show's a train wreck, and I need to show Jeffrey Zucker, who ran CNN for all these years, that I'm doing something. And I go, uh, <laughs> and I'm it. She goes, yeah. So I'm fired. I, I have never been fired from anything from, you know, high school shit. I'm like, okay. So I hang up the phone. First off, I'm like thrilled, you know, but I like, I know that the writers are going to be like, they liked me and the writer's going to go, you're fired. Am I next? So I have to collect my thoughts. I have to get my shit together. And so I get up and I walk by my assistant. I'm like, Hey, Wendy, I'm uh, going to the bathroom. And I go out in the golf cart and I just drive (laughs) into the back lot. And Without, I don't know where I was going, I'm just like trying to keep it together. Like, how am I going to do this? And I end up by the Bates Motel. And I go up and I pull up the golf cart, cart by the original Psycho House, which that movie. Awesome. Is, yeah, that's like Beethoven's Ninth. It's just Iconic. like, like, like it's psycho. And, but if you go on the side, in the back, there was a door. I don't know if what's, this is a while ago now. And I open up the door. It was like three little steps. And I go in, I shut the door. Now inside, there's nothing in it. It's just 30, 40 feet of flats and, you know, two feet high of grass. And I sit on these steps and kind of collected myself and then go, I'm in the psycho house. <laughs> <laughs> and I got the golf cart, went back and told everybody. And I was just like, so, you know, what movies do? For you and me and just it changes our lives. And then actually to be able to have that physical, that's like my best horror related story. No, I mean, I I I have visited the filming locations from the original Halloween multiple times. The Myers (laughs) house, the hedge, the Doyle house, the Wallace house, the Strode house, like everything. And being there is I, I went on a tour of them, like met me, like, I mean, I get it. Like, so I mean, if anyone no, gets it, I we mean, get it. Well, I mean, like I worked at, I was a security guard at Warner Brothers and do you know the movie oh. Deadly Friend? Right, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. the house is on the lot. It's the Growing Pains house. I used to go and sit there on my lunch. 
<laughs> Loser. I know. No, 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 no. But I, it's well, Wes Craven. I was on the Fox lot for a long time, and like I'm really blowing it now because I'm like obsessing on the original Batman series, and they just film by my office all the time, and I and you know I had no idea, but that all that stuff is just like that's um, yeah. There's an energy. Yeah, when I was upset, on Bionic Woman, I would go to stage 19, which is where they filmed the shower sequence, and oh. they were they had a they were doing like a an NBC sitcom, and so I would just take a little folding chair. And find a place and just sit there and go, let me shoot the shower scene here and then feel better. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, look, we have one final question for you, Glenn. And we asked this to everyone, um, including we asked Kristen this. And um, um, just we asked this to everyone that we interview and little puts them on the spot. And you've already told us so many incredible tidbits about these things. So um, what is one thing that you can tell us about your experience working on maybe any of the films that we've chatted about today that you've never told any other interviewer, podcaster, publication, you know, uh, DVD extra. Kristen. That you've never told Kristen. No, <laughs> she just, knows everything. Yeah, she yeah. She knows everything. Just one thing that you've never told in an interview about working on one of these um, great horror films that we've talked about today. Uh, yeah, that you could tell us about. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not, you know, obviously you can see I'm long-winded and you can cut out anything of me you want, but oh, no. I would answer it this way, which is not going to be totally satisfying, but for those, um, anybody sitting down in front of a typewriter or a laptop and a pen and they got to write a horror movie, it's like, really? From my experience and from Bob and, you know, I worked with Steve Spiel Steven Spielberg for a while, you have to like, what? makes you what scares you you got to really be in touch with the thing it's it's hard to do it's like why do you love someone or why do you like this thing why do you listen to this music but what scares you and even if it's like no nah. so for example on final destination i have a thing if i'm boarding the plane i look at the frame around the door i don't want the paint chipped i'm like do they maintenance this plane yeah. It was like a thing with me. And um, I'm like, well, I want that. And then Jim's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he's like too busy. And so I get Mike French and maybe Dean Frist or whatever. I'm like, come here, come here, come here. We get the camera and it's just a push in on that chipped paint. And then how many people have said to me, like in a low voice, as if it's a secret. And I'm always amazed at how like that thing that I thought was unique, a superstition of mine is common to so many other people. So I guess that in a way of like to answer like your secret, that thing inside that you got to like drum up and go, what, what do I want to not come across? What, what, what weird thought do I have that if somebody knew they would <laughs> tell me to get some therapy or whatever, <laughs> put it on paper. No, that's, no, a, I, guess I that's think that's, a, it's relatable. And I think that's a great yeah. piece of advice. And by the way, some of the things, I mean, because of Final Destination, I now always check, you know, the the seat, um, what's it called, tray, because in Final Destination that, you know, the thing falls off. And so anytime I always check that and for some reason, like I'm like, OK, it better be working because I think that like if it's not working, I'm in Final Destination. Anyway, <laughs> that this is like a really yeah, long winded yeah. way of company. I just want you to know, like, just like and we've said this before to people, but truly like you have created some of the movies that we Love totally them. idolize and like the scenes that have stayed with us and movies we absolutely enjoy loving and and movies we watch from over and over and we are so grateful that you took the time to speak with us because for us this is our like um you know getting giddy being able to talk with someone like you who's created all of these horror pieces that we absolutely love so we really really appreciate yeah, and your you time. in your attic <laughs> <laughs> i know yeah i know i'm too long-winded i'm gonna melt in a minute no but and i'm right back i mean it's like the horror fans i really have a what is that term like play it forward and so i feel like for all the todd brownings and uh bella lugosi's and alfred hitchcock's that kept me from sleeping or kept me from like looking at a bird a different way that's my part to pass that on and it just it means the world to me and i and i know for jim wong and all these other guys that i've worked with, people i've worked with that it, it means a lot that you guys go with this and your job is to go out and do that for somebody else and it's a really great also that you guys are here going you should see this you should see that you should see that 
you know, you guys really did your homework and uh, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. We really appreciate that. Thank you so much again, Glenn. Seriously, we really You're appreciate it. I'm sorry this. I went so long. No, oh, this is cool. this is actually like we uh, literally we were just like I felt like we were on the edge of our seat. Like the, yeah. you had great, great stories and great tidbits about these movies that people are going to love to hear. So thank you. We'll definitely be in touch as to when this is going to come out. And yeah, we really appreciate you taking the time. No, I again, thank you very much. Tell Kristen we said yes, hi. Yes, tell Kristen we I said will. hi. Are you she's, I know. I can't believe she didn't come up the stairs. <laughs> tell know. her we said hi and she's amazing. And yeah. <laughs> well, she just, she thinks the world of you guys. Oh, um, we love um, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Take care. Enjoy the rest of uh, your day. You too. All right. Okay, thanks. Bye. You too. Bye. Bye. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Happy Horror Time. This podcast is hosted by Matt Emmer and myself, Tim Murdoch. It's co-produced by Jacob Randall. We release episodes every Monday, and each episode is either a review of new horror films or an interview with a horror star or insider. So there's something for everyone. You can listen to the podcast directly from our website, www.happyhorrortime.com or Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, or wherever you stream. Make sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at Happy Horror Time. We always post the movies we're going to review a few days in advance. So if you want, you can watch them before hearing our spoiler-filled reviews. Mm -hmm. If you'd like to contact us directly, send an email to happyhorrortime at gmail.com. And to support the podcast, please sign up to be a patron at www.patreon.com slash happyhorrortime. Patrons get access to our monthly bonus episodes, our newsletter, autograph stickers and get to vote in polls to pick the movies we're going to review best of all if we get to 50 patrons we're going to start releasing two bonus episodes per month versus one so tell a friend yeah i'm tim murdoch and i'm matt emmert and, and we, we hope, hope you have a happy, happy horror, horror time, time.